Lady Power. The Ownerless World. By Anthony Kuntz. Reading done aloud by an artificial intelligence named Phoenix. New York. Juan Canario unzipped his pants, loosened his belt over his flabby belly and thought back to the day he had decided Melina was the love of his life. The same woman who was now in the bathroom, filling her cheeks with water and toothpaste and spraying foam on the huge wall mirror. The polished marble floor reflected her lusciously pink, naked beauty. What a treat, he thought to himself. Clearly more delights were in store later that afternoon. Juan recited the consulate's number and, at the other end of the phone, an elderly, female secretary listened politely. She wrote down Juan's orders and hung up. Then, looking at her reflection in the glass window, she touched up her lipstick, wiped the reddish stain off the microphone, and glanced at the panorama stretching out from the seventh floor to the blue-gray horizon. Again, the woman thought. Forgetful over time for one reason or another, Juan had asked her to confirm his meeting with Heve and his return flight. Japan. On the other side of the world, although not that far away, Kiru was finishing up her 76th test of the year. For the last two months, she had been working without any assistance and without any budget in a third-class laboratory located in the university's oldest building. Her contract with the Japanese space agency had expired. Once she had placed the intrapolished metal and electrons correctly, the superconductive flooring with a mass of 150 kilograms and a negative weight rose half a meter from the ground. She modified the mass and temperature and then recorded alternative forces in relation to horizontal and vertical movements. The flooring swayed forward, backward and sideways, controlled by laser beams of different colors and gradations. A satisfied smile played over her lips. New York. Just like every morning, the sun rose, and like some women did, she closed her legs. The light entering the room illuminated specks of dust and, as the man left the bed, he tried to catch them with his hands. Being the center of the universe was truly the best. Wanting more space, he got out of bed naked and opened up the windows wide to breathe in the sea air. Justice. Close them, please, the young girl murmured, hiding her head under the pillow. Justice turned, noticed the exaggerated beauty of the girl's back and smiled. He felt a sudden tenderness. He knew it wouldn't last more than an instant but it was satisfying nonetheless. In his life, happiness was just a fleeting emotion. Yes, now it was gone. The screen on the bedside table flickered and a baritone voice from UVC announced a new day. 7.30 a.m., February the 1st. There was still hunger in the world and justice had things to do. At 8 o'clock sharp, Ketrin keyed in the access code to the classic World Wide Web and by doing so allowed the universe to enter the office. A few seconds later, Hundreds of communication channels were displaying Ketrin's voice and synthesized images, which were all answering in the same way. Justice Foundation, good morning. One moment, please. The switchboard identified the origin of each call and repeated the phrase in the relevant language, then forwarded the call to the Justice Foundation representative, either a human or a universal virtual computer unit. Most calls came from related companies and philanthropic institutions, all mediated by the Justice Foundation, causing a vicious cycle between operational agreements and negotiation. Here was the headquarters of the poverty, hunger and charity industry, developed and founded by its most powerful benefactor, William Friedrich Justice, who was responsible for maintaining the systems of balance. Thousands of African, Russian, Turkish, Slavic and Latin American Christians together to demand better sanitary and working conditions during the worst years of the crisis. Because the First World was impoverished, 
the empire of the defenseless was able to flourish. After less than a decade later, William F. Justice was underwriting 130 billion euros a day. This fact made him feel proud every time he walked through the electronic vestibule of the Christmas Building, the nerve center of the Justice Foundation, an entity that administered more than 100,000 food-producing agribusinesses in 14 transnational zones. These included aerospace, oil and telecommunications network industries, which collaborated with entire countries by providing financial and technological assistance. At the same time, the entity offered support to the remaining ecclesiastical authority by bringing together hundreds of Protestant and syncretic sects and cults under the same banner. Last but not least, the Foundation was in charge of the armed forces of continental America as well as the official representative of the Northwestern Bloc, the true origin of an empire. Ketrin, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Justice. The representative of the International Committee for Underprivileged Children has been waiting for you for 20 minutes. I took the liberty of letting him sit in your office. He's as angry as a bear, and I couldn't find any other way to calm him down. As Ketrin finished speaking, she raised her eyebrows and shoulders. Justice stretched out his lips, rubbed his hands over his temples, took a deep breath, and entered his office. The door wasn't fully closed so he could hear the man's strong accent. Son of bitcher. Yelled Herculano Valente, a Euro-Portuguese follower of Manichaeism and an elected deputy of the popular Christian party supported by the foundation. He was facing a number of large 3D posters, framed in AR glass and showing pale, brown-skinned children. On each poster, underneath the words Feed Me, there was an international bank account number preceded by the initials JF. We had an agreement, Mr. Justice, and you broke it. I negotiated the non-refundable loan as well as the printing and distribution of more than 12 million posters, just like this one, in 13 different languages. The Congress of Free Europe gave me carte blanche, trusting that the project would be a success. I helped rejuvenate this campaign, I invested my career in it, and now I find this absurd number printed on my posters. The original account should be 315 to 81, and here it says 315 to 91. How am I going to explain this to the deputies? Tell them the truth. Justice replied, squeezing Herculano's shoulders in a brotherly gesture, before sitting down. We work in the interest of goodness, not for profit. A different bank account number isn't going to alter our main purpose. Use it to assert yourself with public opinion in case your peers try to undermine some of your actions. You'll have them eating out of your hand and the foundation won't charge anything for this gift. Anyway, the foundation never collects. You only give what you receive. Gift? Herculano questioned, almost falling over from the momentum of his huge rocking belly and cheeks. We had an agreement, Mr. Justice. And, and you broke it. I negotiated the non-refundable loan as well as the printing and distribution of more than 12 million posters, just like this one, in 13 different languages. The Congress of Free Europe gave me carte blanche, trusting that the project would be a success. I helped rejuvenate this campaign, I invested my career in it, and now I find this absurd number printed on my posters. The original account should be 315 to 81, and here it says 315 to 91. How am I going to explain this to the deputies? Justice folded his hands together in a gesture of prayer and replied, Enough? What's enough for the poor on this planet? They need everything. 100% of everything. You should be happy you're helping them. I've been a good provider in recent years. Trust me. When you need money to maintain your status, you'll have it. Herculano looked down and clenched his fists with his palms facing the table. Justice continued in a more amiable tone. Fine. Once this matter is settled, why don't we make the most of the situation and register the first contribution right now? When we disclose the list of Samaritans, your name will be near the top. How much do you have in the bank? There is something beyond your intelligence, Mr. Justice. It is your cynicism. 
Herculano stood up, lithe for his seventy-six years, and headed for the door, which opened soundlessly. Before the door closed, Herculano turned around and saw Justice give a hint of a smile. Then, taking advantage of the fact that he had his hands crossed, Justice lifted them up, placed them behind his neck and leaned on them as he reclined in his comfortable chair. Just as the door closed, Justice placed his feet on the table and said to himself, Go in peace.